Listen to the words that God has given us this morning in the book of John, chapter 10, verses 11 through 18. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also. And they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it up from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have a power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. This is the word of the Lord. I want to thank all of our musicians today. It's been a wonderful morning of music, as always, here at First UMC. We uh, are definitely blessed with many groups of wonderful musicians, and uh, that is a, ch- a thing not many uh, churches are blessed with, so we want to thank you all for your hard work and your sharing that with us. Uh, I wanted to say, I forgot to tell you all that how many, who is going to the football game today? There is, is anybody in here? Okay, we have two. (laughs) They're Vikings fans, I know this. uh, There is a bus leaving from Hilltop United Methodist, I believe, today with a group of Vikings and Packers fans getting together on the same bus. We will see if it makes it to Minneapolis. (laughs) When they are going to the Vikings-Packers game this evening, evening game, so if you are watching that game tonight, look for, uh, looks like Kelby and Jan, there's quite a few others from other services here and then elsewhere in the, uh, the city. Or, so you can try to find Bob at the World Series and try to find the rest of them at the Vikings game. And of course, they'll all be wearing Vikings wear. So this morning, we continue our series, Jesus in the Present Tense, the I Am Statements of Christ. We started with Christ as the true vine, and last week we began the story of Christ as the gate, the door. And we continue that story. Actually, our scripture today is a continuation of last week's story. It's all verses 1 through 18 are the full story. But let's go back to last week first. Jesus began his story talking about thieves in the sheepfold. Thieves who deceive and force the sheep to do what they want for the thieves' gain. But that Christ, the right voice, calls us to follow out of trust and to walk through the door to a life connected to God. Christ is the door that helps us to recognize God in the place of thieves, God in this world. Learning the voice of Christ tells us that we are so much more than the thieves of this world would have us believe. Christ reveals to us as a friend that he is the door, he is the journey that matters. Christ reminds us that we are precious to him, and we end last week's passage with the words, The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I come that they may have life and have it abundantly. Our story begins this week as Christ declares, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. This is in contrast to the hired hand who runs when there's fear of danger from the wolf. Christ continues, I am the good shepherd. I know my own just as my own know me. He proclaims to those listening, to the disciples, that that he knows us because God knows us. He tells us that others will join the community. 
He proclaims that his leadership has as much to do with his sacrifice on the cross. Because of his willingness to sacrifice, he retains the power to choose, the power to live, and to be the shepherd. Christ is the good shepherd, the one who knows us best. Now, in last week's scripture, Christ compares himself to the thief that comes to seal the sheep. And this week, he he compares himself to the hired hand. Like the thief, the hired hand is looking out for himself and nobody else. He's hired to care for the sheep, but instead, he's not invested. He does not know the sheep. And so, in the first sign of trouble or danger, the hired hand runs away. The wolf comes near. Instead of thinking about the well-being of his sheep, he runs away, leaving the sheep to slaughter and scatter. See, the hired hand is only interested in his own well-being, his own safety. Christ's words, however, can contrast the hired hand with the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his friends, for the sheep. The shepherd again puts the well-being of the sheep first, the safety of the sheep. This starts in the sheepfold, where the shepherd must put himself physically as the door. But outside the sheepfold, the shepherd must take the wolf head on and keep the wolf from the flock. Now, sheep tend to scatter a little bit when they are no longer in an enclosed space. So when the shepherd is trying to protect the sheep. The shepherd has to protect sheep from way back up in the choir loft to all the way back over here. The shepherd must somehow protect them from the wolf, must take the wolf head on. You see, humanity is the sheep, and Christ is the shepherd laying down his life on the cross. The cross is always, always present in the book of John. I told you last week that if the author of John could say three things when he really was trying to only say one, he did. Everything has multiple meanings, and the cross is central to all of those. If the uh, the author of the book of John, for him, the cross is in every story. The good shepherd willingly, actively risks his life gives up his life for the sheep, never losing the ability to take it back. How many of you know um, author and theologian C.S. Lewis? Quite a few. This service wins that game. They know, you all know him more than the other services. C.S. Lewis wrote his children's stories, The Chronicles of Narnia. Now, does that sound a little more familiar? Yeah, that sounds, I see the kids are uh, shaking their heads. They recently came out as, as, some of them came out as movies. But these stories are written as an allegory for the life of Christ, especially the character of Aslan. Now, if you've only ever seen maybe a commercial for the uh, movies, Aslan is the lion. So in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the first book of this, that he wrote, Aslan is explaining to some of the children how he had been resurrected. He had been killed and was alive again. For the, if you don't know the story, he sacrificed himself in the place of Edmund, a small boy who, who was a traitor to his family and was thus to be sacrificed. The young boy betrayed him, his family and the evil character, the white witch, claimed him as a sacrifice. So Aslan went in his place, and he explains, though the witch knew the deep magic, the magic that required the the sacrifice of the traitor, there is magic deeper still which she did not know. Her knowledge goes only back to the dawn of time. But if she could have looked back a little further into the stillness and darkness before time dawned, she would have read there a different incantation. She would have known that a willing victim who had committed no treachery was killed in the traitor's stead. The table upon which he had been sacrificed would crack and death itself would start working backwards. You see, C.S. Lewis used the language of magic and fairy tales and, and talking animals to tell this part of Christ's story. 
Christ chose to protect humanity from ourselves. If we look back at our story in Scripture, we are both the sheep and the wolves at times. Our choices, our sins, we put ourselves in danger time and again, whether we are putting ourselves in the hands of the, of the wolves or whether we are acting as the wolves ourselves. But every so often, we shift characters. We act a little bit more like the Good Shepherd. I'm sure all of you can think of a person or people in your lives who have protected you from danger, who put your life before their own. Think of your parents and how they raised you, how they taught you. Think of a a teacher, a friend, maybe an organ donor or a stranger. Many of you will have heard this week of yet another tragedy of guns in our schools. In Sparks, Nevada, a young boy began to shoot his classmates. He could possibly have caused another massacre, one we're all too familiar with, if not for an eight, his eighth grade teacher, Michael Lansbury. This man, he, he gave his life this week to save his students. No other students were killed this week. This is a story that we all recognize, sadly, too often. Not just this week, but other times. A few months ago, there was a, an admin- school administrator who, who talked the gunman into giving himself up. She retained her life. She is a hero because she convinced him. She talked about the love of God and convinced him to put the gun away. Think about those people who daily risk their lives for others, or who daily risk their well-being to protect others, to comfort others, to be there, to be a first responder, to be there in times of danger. These actions are the good shepherd These actions are when we act like Christ. But they are not the only reason that the shepherd is good. Christ continues. Christ says, I'm the good shepherd twice in our story today. The second time he says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. You ever noticed how frustrating it can be to get to know an enemy? I want you to think about someone in your life. Think about a, oh, an old enemy, a personal, a personal enemy, someone who, a boss that was terrible, a friend who hurt you, a, a bully from high school, a bully at work. Think of somebody who has just made your life kind of miserable from time to time. Now, I had a boss in college who was a real real jerk. I know it's kind of mean to say, but he was. You can ask my husband, he'll agree. (laughs) He had a lot of anger issues, and he often took them out on his employees. And I was very comfortable hating him, just flat out hating him for the first year of knowing him. But then, like often happens, he did something to frustrate that lively hate in my heart. Thanksgiving came around, and he invited me to dinner. You see, I was the only person who worked in this restaurant who was in college. All the rest were in high school or whose families lived in the area. I lived, my family lived pretty far away. And so he invited me to dinner. He wanted to make sure I wasn't alone on Thanksgiving. And the more I got to know him through my time working with him, the more I found out why he struggled so much, why he was so angry, why he took it out on us. It didn't excuse his, his behavior, but I understood it, and I could no longer just blindly hate the man. You see, getting to know someone, getting to know someone more and more, suddenly someone you thought you hated and kind of reveled in that hate, there's this spark of love because you realize they're human and they, they have goodness in them. 
The more and more we get to know people, the more we love them, not because we, we find out that they're perfect or we find out that they're just the best person in the world. We find out their insecurities, their vulnerabilities. We find out where they failed and where they struggle in life, and suddenly they're so much more human and so much more real to us. Christ, the Good Shepherd, knows us. Christ, the Good Shepherd, knows me. Christ, the Good Shepherd, knows you. Last week we talked about knowing the voice of Christ, knowing which voice to follow out of the sheepfold into the world, trusting that voice because Christ knows us by name and calls us forth. Christ knows our insecurities and our weaknesses. Christ knows the parts of us we don't want the world to know. You know those parts of us that we wouldn't admit to anyone? Those, those struggles we have. Those places that, that we focus on. Now when we talk to youth at youth group or or in, at a, a camp or a retreat, any of the youth in the room can probably say we talk about self-esteem quite a bit. Would you say so? We talk about self-esteem quite a bit. Now, this is a common theme when we talk to youth, but I've realized lately that we don't talk about it with adults. We tend to pretend as adults that we've got it all together, that we don't struggle with those same things that we did when we were 16. We don't struggle with knowing the parts of us that we're ashamed of. As adults, we have, we have our failures and we have our insecurities. We have those sins in our lives that we just can't get ourselves over and we focus only on them. There are many in this room who struggle and who forget the goodness in them because of the failures. And Christ knows us in our worst. Christ knows our failures are, are those parts of us that we hide, but Christ also knows our goodness. Christ knows that my boss was, was, could be kind in spite of all the anger that most people saw. Christ knows that even hardened criminals, especially those you hear stories about people on death row who have a soft spot in their heart for cats, or for stray dogs, or for children. You have these moments. Christ knows that the best of us. Christ knows the worst of us. Christ loves us on both sides. You see, Christ loves us for all that we have been in our past, what we were when we were younger, when we struggled, Christ knows us for what we are at the moment, our good, our bad, everything we do, we want, we are. But the really cool thing is that Christ knows us and loves us for what we'll become. You see, Christ didn't, didn't come for us so that we would suddenly, when we realize that Christ loves us, become perfect and not sin anymore. Christ knows that we're not perfect and that tomorrow I'm going to sin and I'm going to say something mean to somebody, and I'm going to regret it. And Christ knows that about me. And Christ loves me still. This is what it means to be known by God. Every fault that we dwell on, every sin that we struggle with, is just a part of us. These negatives that we see about ourselves, they stand right next to our kindness, to our generosity, to our love for others. Those of you who raise sheep, I know there are a few of you in the congregation, you can probably tell us how kind of stupid they are. I heard too many stories this week as I was talking about sheep, about the sheep at John Morell's, and that's all I'm going to say about that, but they, they're kind of dumb. But Christ, the shepherd, loves them anyway. Now, I'm not saying that we're dumb sometimes, although sometimes we are, I'm saying that Christ loves us in spite of everything that we struggle with. We, we always strive to be better people. And this isn't because if suddenly I were perfect tomorrow, Christ would love me more. 
This is because that no matter what I do, Christ loves me. And I strive to be a better person. We strive to be better people because we love God. Our love for God is what changes us. To be known by God is to be loved whether we are the sheep, the wolves, the thieves, or the hired hands in the story. You see, the love of God is far greater than our own mistakes. To be known by Christ is to be loved on the inside and all the way out. To be known by Christ is to be called by name and to be loved. Let us pray. God of all things, you know every cell within our body. You know our thoughts, our intentions, and even our misguided reasons. We pray this day that your voice ring louder than all others in our lives, that we learn to follow the Good Shepherd and nobody else. Give us the strength to live lives worthy of your unfailing love this day and in all the days to come. Amen.